Dennis, you built what I might describe as the perfect pandemic portfolio. Amazon, Shopify, Slack, Zoom, Moderna, the list goes on. Is this just a matter of luck, extraordinary foresight, or a combination of the two? Well, look, I think any if you ask any manager about their short-term performance and they don't use luck as one of the answers, then you might have the wrong manager because in the short term, markets are re really driven by perception and, and sentiment, and these things are really hard to, to, to anticipate. And part of our success so, this year, I, I, I think, as well, is the fact that – sorry, please. I was just going to say, as much as I admire it, Let's dispense with the modesty because although I did cite a short-term metric, you're up 45% or almost in the past year. You're up, you know, an average of almost 21% annually over the past five years. Your record over an even longer stretch of time looks similar. You're beating 99% of your peers. So there is something to this. <laughs> um, well, thank, thank you for saying that. Um, yeah, I, I think about the portfolio and more recently since that was the initial question as uh, being fortunate because a lot of the companies we're invested in happen to provide services that help productivity, help time efficiency. And I think when the world goes through something dramatic and you know unexpected as, as we all are facing, people you know reassess their habits and try to think about how to save time and money and get things done. And I think we're in, in, in a way just relatively fortunate to have some specific companies that would, would benefit in that kind of environment. So the fact that your companies are getting a tailwind from the pandemic as opposed to other business models that are getting crushed, if I understand you correctly, has to do with the, the, kinds, of, the kinds of things or, or characteristics that appealed to you long before this pandemic showed up. Go into that with a little in a little more detail because that's going to give us some insight into your um, into your thinking why are those companies the ones that provide productivity enhancements the kinds of companies you want to own now as opposed to the kinds of companies you wanted to own five years ago no that's a great question I, you know generally speaking what we try to do is collect unique companies and own them for many years and by unique, I mean ones that have what we think are durable, sustainable, competitive advantages. So that's our general philosophy. You know, as an aside, we also try to collect unique people. And while we can't own them, we try to hopefully keep them around in a, in a continuous manner by having a strong culture ourselves. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, the reasons we own them going into this year have to do with those longer term thoughts. And in addition, many of the companies before all this had what I would you know, characterize as secular growth opportunity and, and had demonstrated that uh, in the form of things like software as a service or e-commerce and delivery solutions. So I think certainly they were already attached to some interesting areas of growth. And uh, what's happened more recently is, uh, and unexpectedly, uh, you know, some of that has accelerated in, in, in many of the cases. So that would explain, say, Shopify or Slack does not explain Moderna. How does a growth equity manager who's concentrated in internet and software stocks end up with what turned out to be one of the most promising COVID-19 vaccine developers? Well, look, you know, we don't actually do a lot of what I would call biotech investing in general. I think it can make some sense to, to bet small to try to win big because some of the outcomes that are attached to those kinds of companies can be very large. And in the case of the, the few that we own, including uh, the one you mentioned, we tend to look for companies that have broad solutions that might have different types of applications as opposed to betting just on one drug and one outcome. So I think what's attracted us to some of the biotech companies, including Moderna, is that quality that they have a platform approach that if it works, that it could work in some cases or many cases as opposed to having, let's say, like one shot on goal, like you have in many biotech scenarios. Dennis, you used to have a lot of exposure to the so-called FANG stocks. Amazon is the only one really left in size. What does sticking with Amazon but selling down Facebook tell us about your investment philosophy and your process? Well, generally, we do still like some of those companies. And depending on if you look across our whole platform, we still have some meaning of meaningful exposure to a company like Facebook as well. Uh, but just generally speaking and broadly, 
as these companies have gotten to be so big and now their dominance seems you know very obvious particularly in hindsight it just it does you do run into some problems as a very large company that even if your end markets continue to have a lot of growth potential there are, are issues that we're all you know hearing about and, and those companies are facing with regard to regulatory uh, challenges and risks uh, and some really complicated questions there so i think we're always going to be looking for wh where we think the best opportunity set is and try not to be dogmatic in how we invest. And it just uh, the combination of the, the size of those companies today and the uh, ability for them to compound at a high rate going forward in relation to maybe some of the other things we've been more currently invested in, in the last two or three years, which we think were smaller companies with, with still big upside. I think that's really been why we've made that transition. And uh, hopefully what it says or, or indicates about our approach is that we aren't dogmatic and we're gonna look for where the opportunities are as opposed to maybe thinking that there's sort of one formula or code or something of that nature that's going to always work in every environment or that certain companies are the only ones to focus on. So let's talk about Amazon for a moment. It's a trillion dollar company, trillion dollar plus. Um, it's certainly attracted some regulatory attention. It's attracted political scrutiny. And yet it remains one of your top holdings. Is, is there a special reason for that, or do you share some of the same concerns about Amazon's prospects as you might say a Facebook or a Microsoft or a Netflix, et cetera? Well, you know, we, we still, as, as you know, own a lot, so we, we, we definitely think their prospects continue to be bright. I think one thing that has always um, differentiated Amazon versus some of these other stocks that they're, it's often grouped with is that there are some real world, you know, challenging. Um, uh, solutions that they provide in the form of logistics and things that exist in the real, real world. So their competitive advantage has not always been just the aggregation via the internet um, or other means of large customers and sort of making a lot of money due to, due to the scalability of those kinds of approaches, but so a lot of real world investing that takes a lot of time and energy and is very ch hard to replicate. So I think we've always said, and I've I've had a, a history of, you know, usually using Amazon as my favorite stock if asked that question, simply because I think uh, the real world and the, you know, the sort of online plus real world combination is really, I think, um, hard to overcome. It also has an exceptional culture and, and you know, obviously CEO and founder that, uh, you know, really thinks long term and, and is willing to make investments in the short term to get to a much bigger end game in the long term. So. That's why we're still, you know, focused on Amazon and the portfolio. Dennis, one last one for you. Um, it's become harder for many people to operate during the pandemic for obvious reasons. But for an investor like yourself, right, you can't visit companies. You can't kick the tires. You can't look under the hood. You can't meet with CEOs and see the whites of their eyes. Has that made it difficult to build conviction about new investments? Um, I don't think so. Uh, you know, it's amazing. And, and, and you know, one of the uh, most uh, interesting developments during this period of time has been the ability for video conferencing to uh, enable people to interface and get to know each other. And I think, you know, how and just and how fast that's been adopted is something that's, I think, commonly accepted. Uh, you know, so I think there's tools to, or, to engage with companies, new investments and, and old that make, uh, you know, that have, have made that less challenging than you might think at first blush. Uh, so ultimately, we're still happy. And, and look, my perfect day is, 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 is reading for three or four hours and, and, and getting to do analysis, not necessarily going out on the road and visiting companies. But that's my personality. We've got all sorts of people with a diverse backgrounds that have uh, different ways of adding value for the team. And they've been able to continue to do so, I think, in a manner with video conferencing that, that helps us be, hopefully be effective going forward.